Thank you. Well, I'm actually a bit nervous, which is <laughs> strange. Um, um, I'd just like to say that um, what, what I want to talk about really is, is not so much how, you'll do, how you might do advanced care planning, but really to highlight some of the issues and challenges and barriers and um, concerns that, that do arise and, and can arise for people when you're attempting to actually have this conversation with people uh, in relation to how they might like their last days managed. And um, oh, actually, I've got a little... Is this a... Uh, this is my outline of what I'm going to talk about. I actually wrote so many notes beside my slides that the first three should take an hour, but there you are. Uh, what I wanted to do very quickly is, is um, talk about history and definitions, and then I have to say I've got quite a lot to say about the US, uh, mainly because that's where most of the research comes from in relation to advanced care planning. Um, and then I'm quite interested in capacity and surrogates, obviously, because of my interest in, in, in dementia care and in old, frail old age. And then uh, looking at the complexity of advanced care planning and in different settings with different groups and just a few concluding thoughts, if I don't run out of time. Um, you'll remind me, won't you? <laughs> There's actually an enormous literature on advanced care planning um, using the language of advanced directives, which I'll touch on in a moment, and also a huge literature on ethical and ethical discussions around this. So, and I've also brought with me a few of the documents that you can download uh, from the uh, NHS UK on advanced care planning, things like uh, capacity care planning, decision making decisions and so on. So I'm not really going to talk about those because you can look them up. I want to just talk about issues really. And um, what I suggest, if you are going to move on to doing advanced care planning, it does appear to be happening in the country in different places, is that you do it in a very much related to your specialty field and in your, your um, specialty groups, that it's not so, you know, one, one um, formula for all. And I think I'd like to make, you know, make that message clear right at the beginning. It's, it's about your relationships with the type of uh, groups of patients that you actually look after. Just a little bit on um, last words. I was trying to think of some um, literature where uh, people have, um, you know, f famous literature or, or stuff you might know, um, where people have said their last words on the deathbed, because, you know, historically that's, that's where this, this kind of idea of um, talking about how you might want things to be sort of comes from. And basically it was people talking about what they wanted to happen after their death. So we've moved now to this idea that people are, ask, uh, are making plans about the space from when they think or know they're going to die till when they die. And actually, there's not so much about um, after death, which I'm particularly interested in, particularly near-death experiences and the whole and, and spirituality. And, and, I, and I do think there's, there's a bit of a um, gap in the uh, advanced care planning literature and, and quite a lot of the, the sort of policy documents um, in relation to spirituality. And I have to say, I did note that there wasn't much mention of ethnicity and culture and, uh, so far today, and I, I will address that a little bit later. But I was thinking of Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte. You know, Jane Eyre's aunt um, was um, asked by her husband, Jane Eyre's uncle, to look after her, and she didn't. So then she spent the rest of her life in a state of guilt and had a terrible death. Have you seen? Everyone knows Jane Eyre. Had a terrible death experience because she hadn't resolved that guilt and so on. So a lot of the um, issues around end of life and uh, last words and last discussions can actually be about issues that have not been resolved, and, and they are complex and they're very personal. Uh, I was thinking of Sense and Sensibility, if you've seen that, and that's very funny because that's where um, uh, the girl's half-brother promises their father that he'll look after them by time, you've, do you know, have seen the film? Um, by time they actually arrive in London, his wife's convinced him that actually they should be giving them something. And the other one is The Mill on the Floss, if George Eliot's, where the... Um, the father asked the, the children and their mother to avenge the person who'd wronged him legally. And they had a lot of, uh, they struggled with this ethical dilemma of whether they should be acting, you know, um, carrying out their father's wishes that he, that he left on his deathbed or, or gave them on his deathbed. So now, um, 
when you think of wills, wills are about property more, and then living wills came into, into act in the um, 1960s in the US, and the language sort of moved on to advanced directives. And a lot of the contem contemporary literature actually still uses advanced directives, in, and you see them in New Zealand. So I, I've looked at the um, Medical Association, they've got that terminology, Australia has that terminology. So it's kind of back and forward between, and I'll try and show where they fit in advanced care planning. Um, and it's come about, of course, because of technology, changes in technology, because now you're not, you're, you're not going to have those words on the deathbed because you're pretty sure you're on your way to that. They're actually about what's happening between the knowledge and the actual, the actual death. And uh, we all, and I do believe New Zealanders are a bit more up out there and talking about stuff than the UK tends to be. And so I think a lot of us talk about where we want to be buried, uh, well, we do in our house, um, and how, whether we want to be cremated or not. And those discussions actually do take place, but I don't know if enough of them take place in relation to what might, we might like before that event. My mother is adamant that we're not allowed to bury her in the Karamea Cemetery because she doesn't like it. And that's going to be difficult, <laughs> but that's something we'll have to come to later. So, and I have got a few questions to uh, ask you as well, or at least at one to the whole group. But there's this, this whole thing about, you know, what actually is the aim of an advanced directive? What, what, why are we doing it? What, what, um, what is the purpose? And is it about, you know, <laughs> and certainly, I, I mean, it's just a, a joke, in fact, there isn't that um, lacking in seriousness. People don't want to die. And in America, you do have a, a very strong sort of um, anxiety about actual death, and, and people actually have themselves, what do they, they, they get frozen in, in case they can be resurrected and so on. So, so there's kind of this whole sense that we don't want to die anymore and that dying isn't really part of our life and we'd rather give it a miss if we possibly can help, possibly can. Um, and what is, what is happening, and I, I did have a sense that this was going to talk about this morning, is, is actually the efforts are more at um, getting the numbers up. We want lots of people to have made these plans. And the research has, has been quite a lot focused around getting numbers, increasing these numbers, but not that much on the outcomes of actually what happens after these care plans have been made. And Kerry did talk about the complexity of actually um, being able to measure outcomes and w what did they make any difference. There is, and in fact, there's really discouraging findings from hospitals, and she did talk to, about that as well, and it's particularly so in the, in the US, is that um, they don't make any difference to the experiences of people in hospitals. No one necessarily looks at them or um, takes any notice of, of them, or they start... Uh, getting family members to give their view, and these are stressed family members who maybe haven't had the conversations. So we kind of sold them as um, how we can get control and take charge, and that um, we need to find a, a surrogate. And so we sold them with this idea of um, that we mightn't have our wishes adhered to, so we need to make sure that they're well, well in place and that they're written and, and someone will be able to, to actually decipher them. And also, the choices are really strongly influenced by the altern or the way these alternatives are delivered. And I have to say, this is a lot from the US literature as well. So, and and I, I'm, I've only been back three months, so I don't have any claim to what's going on in New Zealand, apart from what I've heard this morning. Just a few, just a bit on definitions. A general, a general care plan is just a conversation. It's a plan. Um, it's not legally binding, but it can be written and signed, but doesn't require a, a witness. But it's about the con that's the starting point, having these conversations. And I really liked what Simon said earlier. It's actually, they should be going on in schools, and they should be going on all the time. Families like you know, chat over the table about what you might want when you die, just in case you forget to tell them later, or in case you get cognitive impairment and you know get round to saying it again. And so everyone in the family and everyone you know. Are, are, no, or, or you're significant people. Uh, and the French have this word, your entourage. Your, your, your entourage? I think my French is rubbish. But basically, entourage is all of those important people around you. And um, those conversations should be going on all the time. And, and I somehow, I think I've forgotten what New Zealand was like, but I always assumed we were much more upfront there. 
As far as um, advanced care planning goes, that is actually a written, usually, a, well, it is a written document. Um, it is, must be done with someone with capacity, and I'm going to go on to capacity later, but actually it is the patient is in control of that advanced care plan. It is their plan. They'll show it to whoever they want to show it to. Um, it gives their wishes and values and et cetera of what they would like to happen to them if, if because you can make these before you've got a, a life-limiting illness, but usually it's not made until then, um, what they'd like done. And they become a guide to the MDT, the, the teams. An advanced decision to refuse treatment is usually very specific. Um, I'm sure you know all this, actually, so I can go over it quite quickly. It's very sp specific about a particular thing that you don't want. It's legally binding, it's signed and witnessed. And it must, the person must have capacity as far as um, do not re attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation, that is usually um, done with a clinician. It's, it's often um, their responsibility and it's much more related to um, a, a acute events in hospitals. And uh, it is important that um, if it's anticipated um, that a, a, a resuscitation will be potentially successful, that uh, the clinician's judgment takes precedence. And all those things I've just said you can see on these uh, online, on, on the internet, on the, um, the website, the NHS website. So just a quick uh, um, overview of what's happened in the USA. All 50 states um, and the District of Columbia uh, have some type of advanced care planning legislation. And Oregon, since 94, has a physician-assisted suicide. State of Washington, since 2008, has physician-assisted suicide. And Montana, since 2009, has physician-assisted suicide, which is very interesting. And what I found interesting is apparently Oregon has the highest level of people with advanced directives or advanced care plans. There's a lot of media push. My take is they're probably making sure that no one, they don't get physician-assisted physician suicide. So they're making sure that everyone's really clear about what they do want. Um, but those things, that, that, that discussion is quite um, big in the UK at the moment. And people talk about the slippery slope and the motivation and so on for physician-assisted suicide. But I'm not going to talk about that anymore. What happened in, 19, in the early 90s was the Patient Self-Determined Act, the PSDA, which actually influenced uh, a lot of the um, advanced care planning that went on it, that, that's um, now in place in the US. But the specifics vary incredibly across the states, massively. And there's quite a lot of concern about what the motivation is for this government, particularly around uh, expensive, that last that last period of life, which is, can, can be the most expensive, where it's looking at cost savings, and cost savings come up quite a lot. And I, I have quite a lot of concern about that. And I was in Seattle, a hospice <coughs> vis, uh, ward round uh, um, a couple of years ago, and uh, looking at their prognostication of the last six months to go into hospice care. And they have to be absolutely fine-tuned, because you only get the money for six months. After that, you're supposed to die. Uh, so, so there's this kind of real, real um, tight um, sort of assessment goes on to make sure the person is going to be able to have their money or, or you know, only get six months worth of money and not run out. And this, this whole idea that, um, we, and, and New Zealand's a kind of public health service really, isn't it? I mean a private health service. And this idea that it's a bureaucracy, the UK people will agree. And it's a very real concern in the UK that we're moving towards a, a um, a system like the US where you have to have insurance and you have to pay for your care and so on. Because the, the, the NHS is very precious to, to the uh, Brits. And you can see why uh, from the question this morning about uh, having to pay for a GP. 